Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another uh, Indiana, Indiana University South Bend pop-up university uh, with our friends at Lang Lab South Bend. Uh, tonight we have uh, another exciting lecture for you uh, from our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. An Manyan Park. And we will uh, get started in just a moment. Uh, let me... Uh, give you a little introduction to, uh, to Pop-Up University. Okay. So again, welcome. Uh, <clears throat> Pop-Up Pop University is a, a production of IU South Bend and, uh, and Lang Lab. Normally, of course, we have these at Lang Lab itself, but uh, dirt for pandemic purposes uh, this fall and next spring, we'll be doing them through uh, the collective excitement of IU, of IU Zoom. Tonight we have, for, tonight we have for us, as I said, uh, Professor Ann Manyan Park, who will be uh, talking to us about her adventures in, in uh, tra international translation as well as, well as uh, her student, Haley Hamilton, who'll be joining us. <clears throat> Pop-Up University uh, is a combined effort of, uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the IU South Bend Office for Civic Engagement uh, run by Dr. Gail McGuire. If you are interested in partnering with IU South Bend, uh, looking for a faculty or staff member to uh, get you uh, to uh, get interns to you, uh, or talk about other ways that campus that campus uh, could engage people in your walks of life. Uh, contact information is there for uh, Professor Gail McGuire, uh, and also a and it's. Also uh, presented by uh, the IU South Bend Center for Excellence in Research and Scholarship. Uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm the director of series at IU South Bend, uh, and glad to help you find ways to bring uh, IU South Bend exper uh, uh, expertise of faculty and staff uh, in, organ in organizations or other places in need in the community. I would, of course, uh, like to thank our sponsors. Uh, Pop-Up University is sponsored by Indiana Humanities, and, uh, to whom we thank for their, uh, for their support. Uh, also, the, I, the IU Bicentennial Office. This is Indiana University's bicentennial year, and they've been terrific in supporting this endeavor to bring Indi uh, South Bend's Indiana University to the uh, Okay, I think I get the feel. Oh, all right. I'm seeing some chatter in the chat room that there may be some audio issues. Some people can hear me. Yes. Okay. So I'm just gonna uh, just gonna keep on as if you can hear me, um, because some people say they can. Maybe although some say they can't. We'll sort it out in a moment. Maybe. So uh, as I mentioned tonight. We have uh, Professor An Manyan Park uh, as our final speaker, as our final speaker of 2020. Uh, An received her PhD in English from uh, Université Rennes 2 in France, and she teach, she's taught Anglophone and Francophone literature, English as a second language, and French in the United States, in France, and in New Zealand. She specializes in literary translation, translation studies, Pacific and indigenous literatures in English, and Francophone literature. She's been the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, uh, an International Council for Canadian Studies Award, and a, a Government of Canada Award, and a French Ministry of Education and Research Award for her work on poetry. Uh, her French, or co-translation in French of Maori author Patri Patricia Grace's book, Electric City, received a national translation grant and, uh, in France. 
Her current interest focuses on the concept of hospitality to explore uh, translinguistic and transcultural issues in Maori literature and French immigrant literature. At, at IU South Bend, closer to home, She's received two trustees teaching awards and is a member of our faculty colloquium on excellence in teaching and is extremely popular with our students and does uh, a, uh, just wonderful things in our curriculum, which you'll see tonight because she is uh, because she's joined by her student assistant, Haley Hamilton. Haley is a third year French major at IU South Bend and the French club president. And she's already teaching first grade French immersion at Clay International Academy. And she also helps to translate stories as part of Translate for Toddlers in her free time outside of school. And she also works to translate comics. Uh, so we have uh, a really, exci uh, really exciting presentation here tonight. Enough about me. I'm going to stop this chair um, on. I assume that's where I come in. Okay. Yes. Oh, perfect. Look at that. <laughs> okay. We, wonderful. We totally planned this. See? <laughs> that's uh, fabulous. So, so uh, I'm going to then start sharing my PowerPoint, if that's okay. Wonderful. Here we go. And uh, slideshow from start. Great. All right. You can see it. Looks wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Josh. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for uh, joining us tonight. I'd like to thank uh, Grail McGuire for her tireless effort to uh, bring communities together. I'd like to thank also um, the IUSB community for offering me a home, a professional home 14 years ago. Um, I wanted to start uh, with a picture. Josh, yes? I, oh, th uh, thank you for noticing my pensive uh, movements there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just realized in the kerfuffle about the, uh, about the audio, uh, yeah. I, I, I got off my stride and forgot to mention Q&A to people. Oh, yes. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you'll notice we have the Q, if you look in the bottom of your, uh, in the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see a uh, you'll see an icon that says Q and A, and it has a couple of speech bubbles next to it. Uh, feel free to type questions in there that will be uh, that uh, that our presenters uh, will address at the end of their talk. And tonight, uh, uh, for those of you who've been around before, uh, you know we usually take these in text and field them in order. Uh, but tonight, uh, because of the linguistic, because for a, a more exciting linguistic experience, our presenters would love it if you would uh, like to present your questions live. So if you mention that you would like to give your question live, we will turn on your audio and video so you can share with us uh, as a face-to-face -face human being. Uh, although text human beings are also wonderful too. Yeah, with uh, or without camera, if you're, you know, that's yes. okay, but I'd rather have a conversation than just a, you know, yes. a question so that uh, sometimes it's also good to know what's behind the question and, you know, and, and have a conversation that way. Um, yeah, and then we'll use a chat box because they'll, you know, I'm going to have people work a little bit, okay. which is, a, which is different than the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Anna. Take yeah. it away. <laughs> so I'd like to start with uh, a picture of, uh, that I received two days ago. Um, as you can see, there are three, three people here, but the, the two people on the left are former students of ours. They're teaching English in France. And um, I, I just wanted to start with this picture because uh, to me, they embody how people embrace and pursue how a chosen language takes them uh, wherever. Uh, a chosen language takes them and it looks like pure joy. And they don't worry whether or not uh, the language they've chosen is more marketable than another. Uh, they're just enjoying the ride and are pursuing every opportunity to uh, truly engage in that, in that language. So um, I like to start uh, first and foremost um, to know what you're listening from. So if you'd like to uh, write that down, in the chat box, that would be absolutely fabulous. And for the students, uh, don't forget to sign in by writing your name and your class number in the chat box as well. 
So I like to use little uh, stick figures uh, here and there to illustrate uh, what I'll be talking about this evening. Uh, I, they actually borrowed from my, my daughter, Nina. I was introduced to multilingualism through my gorgeous Italian godfather, whose picture you can see here. And of course, if you don't have an Italian godfather, what are you doing? Um, and his wife, Annie Passini, he gave me one of my first books in translation when I was 10, uh, a book by Bernard Benson that you can see here in its English uh, original, the peace book I have, and I immigrated actually with the Le Livre de la Paix um, and for its uh, French translation. And uh, that book uh, got me and as well as my friend, a uh, hippie friend, Miriam Boucris in trouble when uh, we were in the Girl Scouts. Uh, we actually got kicked out of the Girl Scouts for um, you know, venting about uh, nuclear weapons uh, instead of hiding in bushes and um, winning badges for achievements. So that's when I, I first uh, learned that translation could get you into, uh, into good trouble. Ti amo padrino and padrina. So now out of self-care, I'll be looking at my notes as you can already see, I'm a slow speaker and I really want to give you as much information as possible. So I hope you'll bear with me. I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. We're very lucky as jo uh, Professor Welsh uh, just told us, uh, we'll be joined today uh, by a student, Haley Hamilton, and Haley will have the final word as students should. So um, I'm going to now start with the talk itself. Um, I'd like to start with a story, if I may, uh, because what are we as translators is not border crossing troubadours and uh, story carriers, story messengers and, and recreators. In other words, uh, translators are folks who are involved in the act of circulating stories by rewriting these stories through a creative and an interpretive lens. Um, and this is a story of, uh, Mar by Margaret Mahi, an author from Aotearoa, New Zealand. She won uh, the Hans Christian Andersen for a body of work in 2006. And the Hans Christian Andersen Award is considered a little Nobel Prize for children's literature. The story is simply entitled The Bridge Builder as an homage to a father who was a bridge builder. At the beginning of the story, the unnamed bridge builder uh, build bridges for a living. He's a passionate bridge builder who diligently builds the bridges uh, he is commissioned to erect for what we imagine are local, regional, or national authorities. Mahi describes how the landscape is altered as his bridges enable communities to form, new paths to be created, but soon the bridge builder has to retire and it dawns on him to create fantastical bridges with untried material in the bridge building industry. So uh, those materials are clocks and vines and horsehair and violin strings and glass, even uh, water and sea creatures. So this is how Margaret Mahi describes the bridge builder's new vision. Soon my father took it into his head to build bridges in unexpected places. He gave up building them where people were known to be going and build them where people might happen to find themselves. Somewhere far from any road, sliding from brush to and ferns to reach a remote stretch of river, you might find one of my father's bridges, perhaps a strong one built to last a seven years, perhaps a frail one made of bamboo canes, peacock feathers and violin strings. Who wants a bridge like that anyway? Some people asked sourly. Anyone, someone, my father answered. There are no rules for crossing over. But a lot of people disagreed with this idea, with this idea of my father's. Such people thought bridges were designed specifically for cars, mere pieces of road stuck up on legs of iron or concrete. Whereas my father thought bridges were the connections that would hold everything together. Bridges gone, perhaps the whole world would fall apart like a quartered orange. This world, my father thought, was playing a great game called change and his part in the game was called crossing over. So um, he gets into trouble, into a series of trouble, um, is chased by uh, authorities who want to uh, put a stop, put an end to his illegal bridge building. And I won't spoil the end, it's a, it's a beautiful ending. Um, and it's uh, throughout narrated by his uh, son, Merlin, who was a magi magician name. 
So in this story, uh, bridge building is envisioned as a creative instrument, a creative agent for change in a world that is by nature in a perpetual state of flux. In that respect, he is a threat to an engineered landscape for authoritative figures who intend to control people by controlling where, when, and how bridges are built and then cross. The image of the bridge builder has been one of the most common metaphors for translators, arguably a tired, met tired, tired metaphor. In as much as translators are instrumental in building bridges, that is avenues of communications between cultures. This metaphor usually carries a very positive or rather positive connotation. Now, one may wonder, were translators of the Bible during colonial times bridge builders in certain contexts? Is translation a bridge or an instrument of oppression? I don't mean to antagonize our Christian friends here. I am using this example to emphasize that the same bridge can be interpreted differently depending on the communities and the individuals who experience it. So what motivates a translation? Do the translators' politics play a part in the process of translation? If translators are bridge builders, what would be a nap metaphor for publishers and distributors since they are often the larger infrastructure translators rely on to send their stories, uh, you know, their stories out? Now, metaphors have their limitations. When we keep talking in metaphorical terms about translation, we run the risk of making the translation process perpetually invisible, obscure, and esoteric. At the, and that's an issue because readers are seldom given access to that process, and yet that very process determines what they read. Engaging in the process of translation itself, which we'll do in a second, is a more productive bridge to build with one's audience to better understand the translation process. Most translators have uh, received emails from colleagues and friends who tell them, hey, I've got 10 pages, um, you know, I would love for you to translate them and you know, it will only take you a minute, not realizing that you know, it will take hours of work, if not days or weeks of work. Uh, so translators may be bridge builders. Uh, they are not multilingual photocopying machine and that is why you should be aware of them. So before I talk with you about the translation process, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. So the first question, um, I would like you to, to draw a mental list of one to five authors who write in languages other than English. And if you can't think of an author, but you can think of a, a book title, that's great too. You can share it uh, in, a, in a chat box if you'd like to. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. You can also share it with the people, the uh, animals, plants, and artwork around you. So if you're a reader, um, you might be able to come up with you know, three to five authors already. And if given more time, you'll probably be able to come up with uh, even more authors or, or, or book titles. Now I'd like to do the same question, but I'm going to ask you to draw a mental list of one to five literary translators, whether or not they're related to the authors that you, um, the, sorry, the books or the authors that you uh, mentioned earlier. And feel free to share those. Um, in the chat box as well, or else with the animals and plants and artworks you have around you. And I'm having trouble seeing the chat box, so I'll have to check a little later. I feel more like most people, zero to one is likely to be your answer. So what are we to conclude? from this little exercise. Why don't we know our translators by name? The work of the translator has often been invisible. We may wonder why. What is gained from that invisibility? Who benefits from it? Why is it that a translator's name rarely appeared, it's changing, so rarely appear and appeared on a book cover? The translator's invisibility was highly desirable for societies who wanted to cultivate and often impose onto others their own national cultural aura. The 17th century Frenchman, Nicolas Perrault d'Albancourt, uh, for him, a translation was either beautiful or faithful. Forgive the sexist metaphor, it's not mine. 
So uh, a fine translation must be for him, uh, pleasing to the taste of those who read it. It caters to its imagined readers. To please the ego of a self-centered culture, one needs translation to read as if they were originally written in the language of translation, where culturally specific references can be erased or replaced by cultural references that are familiar or intelligible to the reader in translation, where undesirable passages that clash with the value or taste of its readership and translation can also be wiped out. So if you think in terms of a nation who believes itself culturally and linguistically superior, you have little tolerance for great works of literary genius to be circulated within your national borders in a language that would suggest that they were written in another language. The takeaway here is that for a long time, the translator's invisibility had its own ideological raison d'etre. The creation of the illusion of one's national cultural superiority and the protection of one's national integrity through linguistic unity. Translations were seen and can still be seen as potentially dangerous, a threat to the aura of culture, of a culture who is comfortable consuming other cultures rather than being questioned, enriched, critiqued by literary works written in other languages. So the invisibility of the translator makes ideological sense. If your goal is to draw a window to the outside world while keeping, keeping that window shut, or if we go back to the original metaphor, if you want to draw a bridge without letting anyone cross over or without letting anyone cross over in any meaningful way. So in that case, the love of the translator here is not turned outward, it's turned inward, it's turned towards the self. Can this be called love? Translators work within a larger system that has to do with language politics, cultural identity and cultural hegemony, how cultures uh, impose one another and each other. That's not always at the forefront. This idea of the language politics and so forth is not always at the forefront, of course, of the uh, translators' minds, but they can play a part in some of the linguistics and stylistics choices they make. The books they choose to translate when they are lucky enough to choose the books that they uh, going to translate and that's going, that are going to get uh, circulated. So as someone who translates, I don't primarily think in terms of an original and a target language, uh, the language of translation. Um, if I did, I would have to think of multiple languages because um, very often I, well, I always exclusively work with uh, authors who, uh, you know, whose imagination stem from multiple um, languages and cultures. So um, I think instead in terms of translating an author and more specifically translating a specific project, be it a collection of short stories, a collection of poems uh, by a specific author or, or even a film. I don't primarily think in terms of how do languages of the original text and my language of expression function in relation to one another, but how is language used in this book by this author? in terms of style, of tone, et cetera, the voice. In other words, I do think as a linguist, uh, how language uh, relate to one another, uh, function uh, within one another, but even more so as a literary critic and as a creative writer. I should also add that many translators prefer to say I translate versus uh, instead of I am a translator. And uh, I'm totally on board with that approach. Translating is not just part of my profession. It is what I do day in, day out as an immigrant. Um, it is at the very center of who I am and how I envision the world within and around me. So just like love, which according to bell hooks is better thought of as a verb as opposed to a noun, a series of actions as opposed to a thing that we give, that we receive, or that we look for. We want to think of translating not as a thing, but as an act, a frame of mind which may include a creative attitude towards language, a spirit of inclusivity. It is a way of being, of behaving, of thinking. Now, how does the love of the translator manifest itself on a daily basis? I'll tell you a few personal anecdotes and adopt them if you wish. When I was teaching ENL, English as a new language uh, at IUSB, one of the first exercises I did with my international students was to ask them to create 
a handful of new terms, uh, either by combining two English uh, terms together or by borrowing um, a, a term from the languages of expression and collapsing it with an English term. Uh, those terms were collected in a lexicon and we then use the, these uh, legitimate terms uh, in our class, these terms as, as legitimate English terms in our class. The lexicon grew from semester to semester and uh, you can see a couple of examples here um, and with the name of the students that I haven't seen for like probably 10 years. Uh, I still think of Red Bliss whenever I see a cardinal and I'm uh, drinking my tea in the morning. So uh, the point I, that I emphasized while doing this was that newcomers in the language have as much of a creative right to take ownership of the language, to be playful with the language as someone who is born in that, that language. I also encourage people in my life, students, friends, family members, to think about adopting new ways of pronouncing English, not due to one's accent, which is perfectly fine, but prompted by an intentional and playful engagement with the language. For example, in a household, we don't use spatulas. Spatulas are floss-like floss creature, flexible, but a bit unwilling to lick a ball clean and get messy. We use spatulas because spatulas get the job done. They are spunky and ready for action. And boy, are they fun to maneuver. And I like to thank Ella Chichester. My good friend here has been evacuated in California because of the fire. I uh, hope you're with us, uh, Ella. Uh, the first time that I, I pronounced that word, I mispronounced it, uh, I said spatula. She laughed so hard and she absolutely wanted to adopt it. And so it's been 25 years now since I haven't said spatula um, around the house. Uh, the idea of being intentional in uh, revisiting a language in, in our daily lives, um, of reimagining a word's pronunciation, was sparked unintentionally when I encountered a friend, now Korean filmmaker Cho He, during a graduate school, uh, when he greeted me uh, this way one morning, how are you, Anne? I feel full of vigor today. I swore right then and there that I would never pronounce the word viger as vigor ever again. And I hope you join I, you join I viger game. So the idea is about thinking uh, about the place of language and culture in our lives and how it creates new realities for us and the folks around us. I think of translating as my language of expression, not French, not English. I think of translating as my place of belonging. That loving is first and foremost grounded in a distrust for monolingualism as an imposed form, norm and a rejection of linguicism, which is oppression based on, on one's language of, ex, of expression. And here I just wanted to show you, uh, if you're interested in more talks on translation, there's a wonderful series um, that is available for free online. It's called Translating uh, the Futures. And um, here's just one of the many panelists about activism and translation, but there's, you know, uh, retranslating the classics and translating films and so forth. So you might want to check it out. So I'd like to provide a for frame of reference for these two concepts. So that is monolinguism and uh, monolingualism and linguicism uh, with two scholars who have done extensive work on, on these topics. So I read, uh, and I'm not going to pronounce the name because I know I'm going to mispronounce it, but the Finnish linguist who uh, coined the term linguicism, and for her, it's ideologies, structures, and practices which are used to legitimate, effectuate, and regulate, and reproduce an unequal division of power and resources, both material and immaterial, between groups which are defined on the basis of language. Um, and here, for the definition of monolingualism uh, from Yildiz, for monolingualism is much more than a simple quantitative term designating the presence of just one language. Instead, it constitutes a key structuring principle that organizes in an entire range of modern social life from the construction of, of individuals and their proper subjectivities to the transformation of disciplines and institutions, as well as imagined collectives, such as cultures and nations. In a study of German literature, uh, Yildiz emphasizes the concept of monolingual Western nation states as a construction to create or reinforce national unity, homogeneity, and cultural superiority. 
So in the 18th century, along with the reduced family structure, one mother, one father, and their children, the concept of a single mother tongue around which a nation is forced to unify and that of a mother fatherland become paramount. In reality, monolingual and multilingual communities coexist within nations. They are in effect heterogeneous. Now, ironically, the field of translation is working on more inclusive practices. In a recent interview, that was one last year, um, Veronica Esposito interviews Elizabeth Jacquet on the topic of tra the translations, translations trends and blind spots. And uh, I read the quotes here. Diversity in our field is still very much a blind spot, both in terms of who gets translated and who's doing the translating. Translation is an overwhelming white field. An Authors Guild survey from two years ago found that 83% of working translators are white. Those numbers are even starker when one considers that people of color are more likely to grow up with more than one language. Clearly, our field is actively keeping so many bilingual and multilingual potential translators out. The field of translation, like publishing, and like our country more broadly, has a long way to go, both in terms of recognizing the exclusionary practices and norms that contribute to that, uh, and in terms of active and meaningful inclusion. We also need more translation from non-European languages. Um, all right. So uh, I hope that I gave you uh, a bit of a, of a broad um, of a broad context here. Um, and now I'd like to uh, get you to work and uh, do some translation with you. So that little exercise, I do, I do this sometimes when I um, provide workshops on translation. Um, and the idea is to do an intralingual transition, what we call an intralingual transition in our jargon. Uh, that means from English to English. So you don't need uh, you know, another language of expression to do this exercise. You know, as opposed to the interlingual, which is from you know one language into another language. So I'd like you to replace the words in yellow with a synonym, uh, a similar term. So describes what happens to the text, whether you know the connotations are changed, whether the rhythm of the sentence is changed, whether the tone of the sentence is changed. And you'll you'll um, so that's the opening sentence of if you give a mouse a cookie. And I have to be honest. The first time I read If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, I thought it was awfully cute, but I was not really sure what it was all about. So um, I didn't realize it may have been a, a feminist reading in hiding. Uh, the same author wrote also If You Give a Man a Cookie. I don't know if you read it, but at the end of the book, uh, the man is, um, you know, is having trouble sleeping and is tossing and turning and his sheets and is asking his wife for a cookie. And he realizes that he should get it for himself. So you might want to read that version too. Maybe not to your child, but so if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to replace cookie, ask, and glass in English by Zoom. And you may share uh, your your synonyms in the chat box if you like. So if you are like most um, people, uh, cookie is often uh, replaced by a biscuit, you know, sometimes cake, treat or snack. Uh, a biscuit then changes here. Uh, well, I should say, I should say that uh, first, uh, my, when I give this to my, uh, I show the, um, the cover to uh, people in France, young children in France, I say, where does this take place? And they immediately tell me, it's America, it's an American cookie and an American little mouse because she wears dungarees, she wears overalls. Um, so it's the, the cover itself is already culturally uh, marked. Now, if we uh, choose biscuits, I know that uh, most Americans will think of biscuit as more of a British term and we have a dissonance between the, um, you know, the illustration and, the, uh, and then the words. Um, treat, I know that I make my daughter nervous sometimes when I say treat, she really wants kids, really want you to spell out what a treat is, uh, just because it might mean uh, cheese and, and, uh, and an apple when they really want uh, a cookie. 
So ask here uh, really works well. It's a generic term, right? Um, we don't exactly know what the tone of the mouse is like, but now if you change it with request or demand, you have a very bossy little mouse and it's uh, unlikely that she's gonna get away or he's gonna get, I don't know, uh, get away with, um, with her, you know, with what she's asking for you know, over and over again, um, if she's that bossy. Now, beg for, plead for, will make it into, we turn it into uh, a very mousy mouse, at which point it may not, uh, you know, the, the mouse may not be uh, willing to do all the things that is done in the book. So we're changing uh, the tone here of the, of the book. Uh, now glass uh, can be replaced by many, um, many synonyms. Uh, in America, we have glass of milk, <laughs> have nothing else. If we choose pint, I might ask this little mouse for a photo ID. And if we choose other words like the last one here, uh, we see that there are, you know, uh, connotations like for uh, here for Christian rituals. So uh, we can, you know, you, you can see that just by operating within the same language, now we're not even operating within two languages, uh, changing a word uh, is going to change the different connotations, the different tones, um, and it's going to change, of course, the rhythm also of the sentence. Uh, it's just lovely to have open and you know, uh, the, the E and the U, A ah of the cookie and the ask and the glass of milk. Uh, all those K's are, are beautiful together as well as the S's. So uh, that will change the, you know, the, the rhythm of the, that one sentence. So uh, still, I wouldn't want you to think that translating is about finding the right word. Uh, which I'm often told uh, translation is about when, uh, you know, people who do not do translation, it is very seldom about finding the right word. Do you remember that I said I do not think in terms of languages when I translate, but in the way that an author uses language and uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the cultural context? So here's an example. I'll uh, talk about a story written in English with the presence of a number of terms in Te Reo Māori, uh, an indigenous uh, language of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is titled Love Story and written by Patricia Grace, one of the leading figures of the Maori Renaissance in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In that story, the main character falls in love with a Putuku Manawa, a central post representing the heart of the meeting house. He came to visit on a school trip. As you can see here, the Farinui is the communal house where, where you are surrounded by ancestors standing as card figure. And you might have seen uh, one of um, one Fari Nui um, in the Field Museum in Chicago. As we are explicitly told in the story, the very post that the young man falls in love with is taboo. Unlike other traditional heart posts, it is not only carved in a realistic style, but it had the audacity to represent a woman who was still alive when it was carved. And of course, it's not the, the card figure, it's a fictional story. In the story, the young protagonist is an orphan who intuitively recognizes his great-grandmother, who is the taboo figure carved in a post. She silently beckons him to reveal his genealogy to him in the dead of the night. The story deals with a disruption caused by colonialization onto genealogy and family history. The young man lost his ties to his bloodline, and in the story, a form of incest has unintentionally taken place between two cousins due to the consequences of colonial practices. In a French translation, my dilemma is not whether or not to keep the term Potokumanawa, a term in Te Reo Maori. It has to be kept as one of the terms that Patricia Grace uses to describe the carved po car post. My dilemma is how to gender uh, the noun Potokumanawa. As you may know, French, like Spanish, but unlike English, is a gender language. Hence, le Big Mac, uh, the Big Mac is masculine. So haha, -ha, you may say, you do think in terms of how languages functions after all. Of course I do, but what is more important to me is how language is used by its author. So if I think in linguistic terms, how language functions in general, not how Patricia Grace uses language, or what the cultural context demand, I can try and follow how gendered languages usually assign a gender to borrowed words 
words that the gendered language adopts as their own and to which they assign a gender. Because in Western culture, the putukumanawa is inanimate, it is an object, I have the option to go with the gender of the generic term uh, that comes the closest to putukumanawa, and that would be opposed to pole or pillar. They all, surprise, surprise, they all masculine um, because it's so phallic in shape, perhaps, um, in, in French, right? So I would then translate le putukumanawa as le putukumanawa, right? I would, uh, I would uh, make it masculine. Another option, if I continue to think in linguistic terms, would be to go with the sound of the word. How I would intuitively gender it based on my experience and knowledge of the French language. Most nouns ending in a and a uh, are masculine in French, so masculine may feel right. Based on a phonetic standpoint, I would go again with le petit kumanawa. So right now, I have two votes for the masculine. Now I can choose to go with a story and its cultural reality, how Patricia Grace uses language. Will this lead me to choose a different gender? First of all, the Patukumanawa is not an inanimate object within the Maori cultural context. It is the representation of an, an, an ancestor carved in wood, a wood that has its own history and genealogy. Culturally speaking, not linguistically speaking this time, the Patukumanawa is an inanimate entity. The ancestor that it represents is female, the Putukumanawa is therefore female. I can then hope for la Patukumanawa. By doing so, I have not imposed a feminist agenda onto the text. The text itself and its cultural context have helped me make the decision to use a feminine article for a word, the word Putukumanawa in this specific story. Now, another option, which uh, I have yet to encounter in uh, the world of translation, um, would be to alternate between genders because the identity of the heart post and its taboo status are only gradually revealed in the story. I can also choose to alternate between genders to signal a shift from the traditional and proper to the untraditional and taboo. While doing this, I am also aware that I highlight the process of translating from a non-gender to a gender language by intentionally, uh, by being intentionally inconsistent with the gender I use for a single word, here, Potukumanawa. I can signal in that way that gender assignment is arbitrary and that assigning a gender in translation can be a conscious act, an interpretative act, a creative act. That said, I personally avoid using the text as a pretext for my own intellectual agenda as a translator of postcolonial literature. As I mentioned earlier, Willie, the young protagonist, lost his ties to his bloodline because of the consequences of colonial practices. But alternating between genders in the translation, I can underline the disrupted and complicated history of the post by creating an unstable and problematic relationship between the Potukumanawa not so much with its gender per se, but what the gender stands for in the translation, that is its relationship to a colonial European language. Now, I just wanna say uh, a few words uh, before having um, Heli talk to us uh, about uh, some of the translation projects that we have here at IUSB. Um, the, the one that I wanna talk to about perhaps more in the Q&A is Translate for Toddlers which uh, I've been doing for the past four years with my uh, wonderful colleague, Heather uh, jones Velasquez, and, uh, and with these projects, we um, basically uh, get books uh, that are donated. Sometimes we buy them. We ask our students to translate them. They write their uh, translation in the books, and then we donate them to communities. We also uh, provide um, translation workshops uh, to promote, to celebrate bilingual literacy. So if you're interested, and uh, a workshop, please um, drop me a line, uh, send me an email. We provide through Translate for Toddlers also possibilities, uh, opportunities for our students to be uh, published. And we selected two beautiful publishers, one French publish publisher who um, then um, focuses on uh, topics that are not often tackled in, in kids' stories. Homelessness, you see here, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, the war, immigration. It's always also been a publisher who's been um, promoting 
multilingual um, literacy from the get-go. And very recently, we've paired up with African Storybook, which is exclusively online. And so we've started using it uh, since the pandemic. And what I love about it is um, fostering a, um, a community of writers, um, of, of translators, and it's focusing um, on uh, the many languages of Africa. So if you want to know more, go, go ahead and, and, and check it out. Um, I wanted to uh, finish by reading a, a short excerpt by Michiana Chronicles, but I see that we are running out of time. So I'll send you to Michiana Chronicles for a, um, to, to get a listen for, um, for the, this uh, essay that I wrote about monolingualism and uh, my distress of it. Um, now I'd like to have Haley. Haley, are you there? Uh, should I stop sharing? I'm ready for you. Okay, well, um, can you- oh, excellent. And I'm going to start. There we go. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna introduce you to how I got started with translation and where it has led me at a sweet font. <laughs> Uh, so my translation work began with Translate for Toddlers, and my first PRAW translation was called uh, Lily Nut by Sandra Costa. It's the book on the right um, on the PowerPoint. Um, and it was a collaboration with two other IUSB students, uh, Catherine Behan and uh, Samantha Fizikas. Um, it focuses on an unusual theme for a children's book, which is Alzheimer's. Um, and that experience made me realize that I wanted to translate books or um, stories that I felt really touched on issues that mattered. In my own time, I started doing research on the deaths of Ziad Bena and Buna Traoré, who were indirectly killed by the French police because I was interested in making a bilingual comic. In doing so, I discovered that, most, that much of their story and the stories of other victims of police violence in France were barely translated, if at all. Um, in my research, I also discovered uh, Remedium's comic series, uh, Cas de Fosse Nageur. Um, so each comic strip tells and reflects on the story of a victim of police violence in order to spread awareness. I reached out to the author offering to make English translations of his comics and he was on board. Uh, so, so far I translated three of his comics into English, which are posted on his website. Um, and I'll put the website in the chat and it's um, also across social media. Um, the first comic I translated tells the story of Zineb Khoudouan an 80-year-old Algerian woman who was killed by um, a French police officer. Alice <laughs> Wivant. Um, another translation tells the story of George Floyd um, and compares police violence in France to police violence in the US. This translation was different from the others because instead of translating it after the fact, um, the author actually um, emailed me and was asking me questions about what was happening in the US. Um, before he wrote it. And then um, after he wrote it, he sent me the text before he actually like made the art for the comic. Um, so that way we could um, publish it in both languages at the same time. So an important aspect of translation for me um, is bridging is the bridging between France and the United States, um, because this is a way to spread awareness um, and start an international dialogue about police violence since it is very prevalent in both countries. My most recent translation is of uh, Daddy, There's a Noise Outside by Kenneth Braswell, which is a children's book that explains the importance of civil disobedience. This is a collaboration with another IUSB student, Chris Marchand, um, and we're in the process of contacting the author and uh, to pitch our translation. Uh, the book was actually suggested to Professor Menyon Park by IUSB Labor Studies professor, Paul Mischler. Um, so using my translation skills has been a way for me to do my part in spreading awareness on uh, current prevalent issues. Thank you, Billy. I'm going to stop sharing now. I think we are ready for uh, the Q&A session, if you are. Josh? Sure thing. We're, okay. uh, so uh, yeah, uh, if uh, folks would like to uh, put questions into the Q&A area. And uh, please, if you would like to uh, give, your, uh, give your question verbally, uh, just note, uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to speak my question. I'd like to use my microphone, whatever, we'll figure it out. And uh, you know, uh, otherwise, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie can read it as she's uh, fielding the questions and turning folks' uh, microphones on and off. So we'll give you a moment here to 
uh, uh, to uh, give us some questions. Um, while we're waiting for questions, um, I have a kind of a spin on a, the question about um, process. And I wondered if um, you have any thoughts or advice about um, not just the process, but um, maybe critiquing the process as well as a, as, um, a, a lay uh, um, reviewer of the, of the material, if, if I don't speak the language natively. Um, you know, is there, is there a way that I can assess the process that, um, the translator did go through to, um, uh, to bring the translation to me? Yeah. And that, that's a very good question. I think, uh, what a lot of translators are trying to do right now is to break that of, you know, it's been, it's been a while, but, um, to ensure that the people who like to be honest about, you know, the, that, that process mm -hmm. and to let the people who don't have access to, the original, the, the, the original, um, to know what kind of perspective the uh, translator adopted. I'm a big proponent of introductions, um, and usually in my introductions, I spell out the things that you know the, the the perspective that I have, but also some of the liberties that I took um, out of honesty for the reader, but also just for a, a good conversation. You know, this is my interpretation because as a translator. I am uh, interpreting the text and I'm telling you, this is how I did it. Um, you know, there's, uh, but, but you can do that if the publisher is on board and I think more publishers are on board. Um, I have a wonderful a publisher of on uh, from uh, Tahiti and he, you know, he encourages that. Um, now, you know, there's more, um, because of online publishing, there's the possibilities of having a book published and then having, you know, conversations about the translation separately. Uh, but that's definitely, there's, I think, a number of journals also who are now giving a voice to uh, translators, which I find wonderful, like, uh, you know, the one that the journal that I, I showed you. Uh, I, a friend of mine, uh, Nancy Bakken, who just retired, a USB professor of English, just told me about um, Poetry Daily. Uh, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to take a look, but uh, you know, an increasing number of translators are talking about their process. And uh, I think an increasing number of, of readers are realizing that it is not a photocopy, like a multilingual photocopy, that it is a process and that they want clarity, right? And they want the conversation too. They want to know, um, you know, if I have 10 translations, which one do I pick? Hmm. And why? Thank you. Um, we do have a question. Shana Breslin asked me to read it rather than to unmute her. So um, as related to your explanation of translating gender, do people often assume you have an agenda with your style of translation and how do you navigate this? Um, well, it's, I guess, uh, thank you, Shana, for, for the question. Um, no, I think that's that's been the issue is people don't assume it, right? And then they think that it is already embedded in the um, in the text. What I wanted to show there is to show that how even an article, which seems totally innocuous, right? Something that you would just translate like this, it can be, you know, quite a process. Um, and it is an interpretative act. So, um, you know, that, that uh, I hope I answered the question there. I'm not sure, uh, but yeah, that's. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so kind of like what you were talking about earlier with like translating with like gendered languages, mm -hmm. um, because like you have a good understanding of like the Maori culture and stuff like that, you know what mm -hmm. I guess she's trying to do with her story. How much like research do you have to do? Like, like what if you don't have that cultural context when you're translating or do you only translate when you know? I don't know if I'm making sense of it. Are. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally hear what you're saying. Well, that's, you know, sometimes I get a little frustrated because, and a lot of translators get frustrated in the uh, world of academia because very often people say, well, you just translated it, you know? didn't need to do any research. 
Uh, you do, because if you do, then you really have a good and a solid understanding. You need to, you know, the process for me is reading as much as I can about, you know, the, well, the body of work of, of a particular author and try to understand where does that particular book fall into that larger body of work. Um, and then, you know, as much as possible, um, trying to understand so all the, the layers of, of the novel. Uh, and for that, you rely heavily also on a community of translators. As you can see, I love working with co-translators. I uh, hope I don't have a very big ego and uh, I really enjoy the conversation. Uh, one of my co-translators is Jean Anderson, who's widely published as a translator in, uh, in New, uh, Te Ora, New Zealand. So many times uh, she warned me about certain pitfalls, cultural pitfalls, or uh, you know, I would have, there would be a passage and I, just something that I don't understand. I would, you know, I would ask her, um, there's something that's really bothering me here. I'm not sure why, but, you know, and then through a conversation, we can uh, really uh, find a, you know, a solution, or at least I get to have some kind of background. When you can, you can also, when you have access to the author, and that's, you know, the work I did with Selena Tusitala Marsh, I can you know, shoot her an email and then, you know, when she's not too busy, she can't answer. Um, so it's about also building a community around you, um, you know, being honest about the process, but certainly there's quite a bit of research that you need to do in order to interpret the story. And then once you interpreted the stories and do your translation in. And what I love about the interpretation is, is it, it gives you, you know, a lot of creative freedom but also when people say, hey, I really don't like the way that you translated this, you say, well, I actually, I'll stand my ground or else, you know, well, I think I made a mistake and I would translate it differently. But you have, you know, a, a, good, um, a good story to back it up and given data and, you know, and all of that. I'm gonna read another question and then um, hopefully if people can stay on for a few minutes, um, maybe we'll uh, un unmute a few others. Um, so this question has to do with um, any concerns in the translating community regarding the ethics of translating content that might be considered immoral or destructive. And if so, um, to, to what degree is that present? So it says some examples of what could be considered destructive or corrupting could be um, like content which promotes eugenics. Uh, whether or not they should be translated. Well, um, I'm not sure that's where I'd like to have the person to talk to <laughs> uh, in order to get more, more of a background. Well, uh, there's this, uh, and I don't know whether that's going to answer the question, so I apologize, but um, there's a, an article by Borges that was um, uh, translated by Esther Allen about, you know, translating, for instance, the, the different translators of the Arabian Nights, um, I think in French we call it the Thousand and One Nights, a classic, and uh, by 19th century um, translators, and how, you know, is analyzing how the different uh, translators then uh, take uh, the context and um, make it palatable for themselves. So for instance, any erotic uh, passages might be taken away, but you know, uh, anything that looks, sounds exotic is going to be highlighted, right? Um, so that's, you know, that's what I talked a little bit about, you know, the invisibility of a translator earlier on. So as far as ethics is one of what is your agenda there, right? Uh, whether you're taking away from the text, whether you kind of amplifying certain aspects of the text. Um, but as far as also ethics and, and regarding, uh, you know, who translates, who translates what, uh, I am fully aware of who I am and what I look, uh, look like. Um, and I feel like uh, translating Maori literature, for instance, is, you know, I'm not necessarily the best person, but I am one of the people who's doing it at the moment uh, because of linguistic abilities. I'm hoping that I'll be just a stepping stone for, you know, people who have full knowledge of Maori and full knowledge, say, of Tahitian and who are able to, you know, to create uh, better, much better translations than mine because I, you know, I grew up in France and my French is kind of Franco-French, even though it's very immigrant French now, but 
Um, so, but uh, that that it happens also uh, in translation, as well as in um, in the publishing world. When my, uh, for instance, to to give you an example, my um, co-translator and now, so the same translator, Jean Anderson, uh, approached a French publisher um, to pitch our first translation, uh, Electric City. Uh, the publisher said, "Well." Um, it's a great book. It's a great collection of, of short stories, but are you sure your co-translator is French? <laughs> because there are some passages here and there that we're going to have to smooth out because it's just, it just doesn't sound very French. It's, it's not, you know, it doesn't sound right. And of course she said, well, this is because it's a post-colonial text and the author herself, you know, played with the language, the English to start with and, you know, inflected with Mari's uh, structural um, uh, grammatical structures and so forth and so we did the same and you know uh, the person said no nah, nah, nah. we're going to have to iron that out so I don't know whether by you know that aspect that's what she was so what did we do we said well goodbye to France and we're going to Tahiti because uh, of course we approached our Tahitian publisher and he already knew about Patricia Grace and and uh, never was there a question of uh, you know touching the translation because it didn't cater to the taste of uh, a francophone or rather a French audience. Great, thank you. Um, Catherine and Dan are on and would like to ask you a question. You are unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, and we are a little bit biased because uh, Haley is my former partner and um, a good friend, but I, I know a little bit about your seeking for translating and I would like you to describe as a fairly young person, how it is you decided to go ahead and choose these pieces, this comic strip, this, per, this author to translate and how it is you paid attention to um, in your translation a, a uh, understanding of what he was trying to get across, even though you weren't in France. Okay, so so I first again, like I was um, like I was saying, um, I first um, kind of started branching out of like the translate for toddlers research I was doing because um, I was interested in researching the deaths of uh, Ziad Bena and Buna Traoré, so. Um, they were two teenagers of color who were indirectly killed by the police in France in 2005. And um, there were riots afterwards in France. Um, and so I learned about this in high school briefly. And then I learned about it again when I went to um, this um, Alliance Francaise kind of um, talk. Um, and so I was just like really interested in learning more about it. Um, and so the more research I did, the more like sucked into it I got and I found out that it wasn't just Ziad and Buna but um, so many others um, and so I first wanted to make a bilingual comic because I wanted to um, I don't know I like making comics um, and I've never seen a bilingual comic before so I wanted to make something that would be true to something in French but English readers could also read um, and I had some trouble making the comic and so I would follow like these like hashtags on Instagram <laughs> um, to like do more research um, because a lot of like, um, you know, a lot of the stuff doesn't necessarily make news in France or the victims never really receive justice in France. So a lot of it is on social media. Um, and so through that, um, I found, that's where I found the comics. Um, and so, you know, he just did the comics so well, so much better than me. Um, <laughs> And so um, I just messaged him on Instagram and I <laughs> told him who I was and that I translated comics. And um, so that's how I got into it. I just really like his art. I love um, the way he tells stories because um, in Professor Manion Park, when she read them, she kind of described it as kind of like a, like it, as if like a journalist was writing it for a newspaper. So it's kind of like a news, newsy kind of um, story. But he also like talks about the person and who they were. Um, and it's just like a short, you know, comic strip about what happened and who this person was. So I just, I'm just a really big fan of his comics and I think they do a really good job because um, the whole point of them is to spread awareness, which is what I wanted to do. Cause it's like, what am I, cause you know, I read about like all these 
horrible things that are happening and it's how am I <laughs> a white girl in the U.S. going to do like going to contribute or to help any of this at all and so what I could do is translate and so that's what I did. So so but also I, I would like you to elaborate on that a little bit because um some may be, feel like there's a restriction on people based on their age or their gender or their language and you didn't find that and I would like to hear why not. I mean I, I'm not really sure I just I mean I don't know I just um I really don't know how to answer that because I I never really thought about that um <laughs> I'm sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. So, so, I, I, so I, start, I started this by saying that I, I, I'm friends with Haley, and I would like to actually, um, where she's left off, I'd like to um, give some guidance to anyone else, which is to say your curiosity and your passion can lead you as far as you want to go. Yes, and the foreign, you know, another language uh, can lead you there. Yeah, I'm inspired by Haley, who's just like, okay, I'm going to do this. And when uh, the, you know, Tadio um, started collaborating also in the stories, she didn't realize that, that was pretty special for a translator too. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, we do have one more question. I know we've gone over just a little bit, so thanks for staying if you're still around. Um, I think this is a good question to end with because it's, um, it's kind of a, a a good send off. Um, the question is, what do you like most about translating? And if there's anything, what do you like the least? <laughs> do you want to answer that question first, Hedy? Sure. Or I, first? It's up to you. <laughs> I think um, for me, it's like what I love about translating and what I hate about translating the most is like the, the things that are hard to so with um, the first, like, again, the first proud book that um, I translated with uh, Catherine and Samantha was uh, called Lily Nut, which um, is like, in French, it's Lily Notices, but it's also a pun. And so this was like the hardest part was the title of the book. What do we translate this title? And it was so hard. Um, and then we had this like breakthrough that we would um, change the character's name to Luna. And so it would be Luna Seas. And then there's the Luna Sea. So it was like this big breakthrough and it was like the best feeling ever. <laughs> so that's my favorite part about translating. But again, like, I guess the worst part about translating would be like trying to find that and like the frustration that goes with that. For me, it's the intimacy with the text. I just love being just completely immersed and uh, finding the voices of the different characters is very tricky. Uh, and I love that. That's why I like translating films as well, because it's all about dialogues. And so it's all about the voices of your characters, and the tone that's changing throughout. So really finding, you know, like really getting into the rhythm of a particular style, you know, getting to somebody's head. Uh, but so that's, that's, uh, that's, um, that's incredibly fascinating. Uh, and, you know, the part that I like the least is letting go, <laughs> because uh, you know that you've done your best, but you know there's still some some passages that you'd like to, you know, have a, another year or another decade to think about. So, um, but that's where the publishers are really good at saying that's enough. You, now you need to hand it out, like now, letting go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Josh. Thanks. <laughs> well, well played. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Anne. Thank you very <laughs> much, Haley. This was is a, a terrific end to an exciting year of, uh, of pop-ups. Of pop um, I guess uh, just to let everybody, uh, just to let everybody know, uh, just to remind you, uh, we will see you all next year. We have uh, more pop-up university events coming, uh, coming up in our spring semester. Uh, so be sure to enroll free in Pop-Up University Spring 2021. All you have to do is watch uh, our website, go.iu.edu slash pop-up. And you can also find their uh, YouTube videos of our, uh, of our previous speakers, uh, as well as this one, uh, probably tomorrow morning. So again, thank you so much to everybody for, uh, being, uh, for uh, being, here, being here tonight. And 
uh, please have uh, a, a, please have a, a safe holidays, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you very much. Good night.